Hello, this is Sherry Rostern, the Curator of Education at the Dakota Prairie Museum in Aberdeen, South Dakota. And thank you so much for coming to another behind the scenes tour of one of our exhibits here at the museum. Last week, if you came and looked on Facebook, we talked about an exhibit upstairs called the Suffrage Parlor. Today, we're, ta we're taking another exhibit, and this is our farmhouse from our exhibit called New Dawn on the Prairie. This uh, farmhouse has been around for a very long time, and before we actually head inside, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how it was built. When the museum started in the, here in 1970, this room was actually the very first art gallery. But after a few years, they moved the art gallery upstairs, and they wanted this room devoted to telling the story of the local settlers, the immigrants that moved here and started the farms. They needed a house built, but the museum at the time was just getting started, and they didn't have many funds. So a local group called the Brown County Territorial Pioneers stepped in, and they are the ones that built this partial house. What you're looking at behind me is a, a house that was built using all the practices of the day. It's called a stick build. And it has the two by four walls. On the outside, you have the little clapboards. This beautiful porch that I'm sitting under with all the fancy work. And even a second floor. If you take a look up, the house goes all the way to the ceiling in the top of this space. It's just large enough to show you what an old-fashioned kitchen would be like. And so that's where we're going to get started. You're going to have a chance today to go to a place that very few people ever get to go. Uh, and that's through the door and inside talking about the various components or the artifacts. I couldn't do this myself, so the team is assembled again. We have Patricia on the um, video, and we have Laura Shoneman, our curator of exhibits inside. And as you listen to me talk, she's going to be picking things up and showing you. Now, as we're first looking through the open door, which most people don't have a chance to see, you're mostly taking a look at the stove and the table. But as you get inside, we're going to swing around the corner and we're going to take a look at a big wooden box because that's where it starts. Now, this big wooden box was called an ice box. And in its day, this was an early day refrigerator. This is how you would have kept your food cold, not nearly as big as the refrigerators today. So Laura is opening up the smaller top door. And if you look inside, you're going to see another one of our secrets. She changes this exhibit out several times a year, and so the different artifacts and props that she uses, she normally keeps close by, so they're hidden inside the icebox. But in the old days, you would have put a smaller um, square of ice in there. It's lined with zinc, and that would help keep it colder longer. Close the door, and then as heat rises, cold goes down. So you have a very small, and I do mean small, area where you could put some of the things that you wanted to keep overnight. Now, this wouldn't be quite as cold as the refrigerators of today, but it was certainly better than what you would have used or what would have happened to your food just sitting out on the counter. During the winter during the late fall and the early spring, sometimes it was colder to put your food outside or on a porch, but for the most part, you had this inside. Now, 
as the ice would melt, the water would drip down and collect at the very bottom. And there would be a long, shallow pan down there. And once or twice a day, that would have to be taken out and emptied. And that was usually a job for one of the kids in the family. On top of the icebox, we have it uh, almost set for tea. Your tea would come in your little tin container and it came loose. There was no such thing as tea bags. You would warm your tea or warm the water and then put the tea in loosely. Now that could make for some crunchy tea. So before you would uh, drink it, you would pour it through a little strainer like Laura is showing you, even has some tea in it. And then that would make sure that your tea was beautifully steeped and not crunchy at all. Also up on top of the icebox, we have a little something called a salesman sample. It's to show you if you wanted to go out and purchase an ice cream maker or ice cream churn, the salesman would come around and would have these miniatures that they could show you how everything would work. It's a whole lot easier on them than trying to haul around maybe a 10 or 12 pound piece of equipment. So it's just shrunken down, but all the details are the same. And we thought we would put it out to see if anyone would notice. And it's just a fun thing to take a look at the salesman samples. Now over on the wall by the stove, we have a pegboard. And that has all the things that you need in order to keep your uh, uh, cooking running smoothly. Now most of the things up there you're going to recognize, but there's a couple things that may not look real familiar to you. And the first one Laura's going to show you is called a pot scrubber. Most of the time when you were cooking back in the days when you had a stove like that, you were using cast iron pieces. And as anyone who has a wonderful cast iron pan knows, you never ever put soap in it. So you would have this little scrubber and you would take that with some nice warm water and put it around the pan just in case you did have some things left over and that would help clean it. And on the far side, we have your own individual scale. And there's many different kinds. They can go from a few pounds to weighing up to 10, 15, even 20 pounds. Each kitchen would need one of those, especially if you're cooking and you're trying to figure out how big is a roast. Remember, you're not going to the store in order to get a piece of meat and it'll tell you how much it weighs, so you have to figure that out yourself. Now for the stove. This is a home comfort brand stove. It is a stove that has to be fired by some, uh, some fuel. The best fuel that you could get was coal. And we have a piece of lump coal, not charcoal, but real coal coming out of the ground. Now, since you couldn't find that out on the prairie, that meant you had to wait until there was some kind of a store or hardware store around that would carry that. And then you would either have to go into town purchase your coal, or maybe they would come out and deliver. Coal gave the absolute best heat. It was a slow burning, it was an even heat, and cooks loved it. But say you ran out of coal, you had some other options. Wood, if you could find some trees, but what we have here was a little more common, and they're simply corn cobs. Now, corn cobs would burn pretty fast, and you would need a lot of them if you were going to have that stove heated for any length of time. But at least you had something to burn to either keep yourself warm or to keep your food cooked. On the front part of the oven door on the home comfort stove, it was a little fancier because it has 
a temperature gauge on it. Most of the time when you were cooking, you had to do the old-fashioned method, which was hold your hand over the fire or just inside the stove and see how many seconds you could stay there with your hand before it got so hot you had to grab it back. That's right. So the shorter time, the hotter your stove. This at least gave the cooks a head start on if they were baking bread or pies or cookies, just how long it might take. On top of the stove, you can see that there is a really thick um, metal top. And we've got some pots and pans up there. The one that's closest to Laura would be how you would make waffles. It's a lot of hard work and it is really quite heavy. But this waffle iron uh, opens up and you would have one side really hot. You would put your um, batter in and then put the top on it, flip it around and put it back in the little collar that it would sit on. It wouldn't take long on a cast iron stove to get a nice thin waffle going. Thicker waffle might take a little more time. Also on the stove, you had a way of controlling the heat. So say you were going to go and you wanted to fry donuts or chicken. See how Laura took that little round cast iron piece out. That would allow the heat to come out a lot faster, kind of going from middle high to high. And if you were doing your uh, frying, your deep frying, you needed that oil nice and hot. Now when you were done, you would put that uh, lid back on and then you would have your regular heat on there. Towards the top, we have these two warming drawers. And as Laura pulls them down, she's got some other secrets inside. These are the things that she brings out when it's wash day. Those are irons, but you could keep the irons up there, but most of the time that was to just hold your food, kind of keep it warm in case people were coming in and eating at different times. And then on the top of the stove, there is a huge teapot, much larger than you would ever need to make just a cup of tea. That teapot was used any time you needed uh, hot water, and that could be for uh, doing dishes, for washing your hands, for a bath, for whatever, how many times a day do we go and use hot water from the, from the stove? Remember, you didn't have, most homes at that time did not have hot water coming in or water at all. You went outside and got it at a pump. If you take a look at our lady, who is our, our pioneer woman, she is wearing her summer outfit, and that included a long uh, dress, and that could get a little warm, so you wanted to keep your house as cool as possible. Right next to her, we have our kitchen table. And Laura has it all set for pie baking today. So we have our apples out and the recipe, of course. We've got the uh, big crockery bowl that they would have used to do their mixings. The pie's all ready to head into the oven on its own old-fashioned um, sheet tray or pie pan. I happen to love the old rolling pin that's there. On the table, you may notice uh, uh, something that you would be using, and that would be some spices along with some baking powder. And on the far end, we have a flour sifter. Not something we use a lot today, but would have been used back during the pioneer times. And that leads us to the last piece we're going to look at today, this cabinet. Now, some people would call it a Hoosier cabinet. Uh, the pioneers usually did not put cupboards up on the wall like we're used to. Open shelves could be one thing. So over on the right-hand side, you might notice a little 
well, not so little, but a glass jar. And that was to hold your sugar. That could hold up to 10 pounds of sugar. And people who were doing a lot of baking or cooking on their own, like so many of us are doing today, it's amazing how quickly you can go through some of these staples. That held your sugar in place, all ready to dispense, and you didn't have to worry about any of the bugs or the creepy crawlies of the day getting into it. On the left-hand side of the case, we have a nice large metal tin that pulls out, and that will hold up to 50 pounds of flour. Remember, everything was done from scratch, from bread to rolls to buns to the beautiful cakes and the cookies. So if people had any size family, they would really be going through the flour. There's a little uh, window in there, an oval window, and that would give you an idea of just how much flour was uh, still left in your bin. It comes down to uh, a little black um, chute, and as you would turn that handle round and round, the flour would come out and it would automatically be sifted for you. Again, it the things were put in there in order to keep them clean, to keep the bugs out. Along the back wall of that Hoosier cabinet is a little shelf, and it's a perfect place for our cook to keep all of her little spices and uh, different things that she would need for her baking. Up above, we have the canning jars. Now, when canning first came out in the early part of the 1800s, it wasn't always so uh, reliable. But by the time Aberdeen was started in 1881, you could can and keep almost anything. So the main ways that people would preserve their food was either salting or drying or the canning. And many of us are used to having beautiful, fresh fruits of the summer or pickles canned at home. But you can actually do a lot more than that with different kinds of vegetables as well as meat. Very last piece on this cabinet. Uh, some people, when they were looking at it yesterday, thought it looked a little bit like a weapon from the future. It's actually a cherry pitter. If you've ever had the pleasure of making a cherry pie with real fresh cherries, you have to make a slit in each one and make sure the pit comes out. This, by putting the cherries in and turning the handle, you could make three cherry pies in probably three minutes. The pits would come out of one part and then the freshly uh, pitted cherries would come out the front. And it sure made it a whole lot easier to make your beautiful desserts. Well, this is our second attempt at having you come and take a look at the inside of one of our exhibits. Stay tuned, and next week we might be doing it again. Thank you for, for staying around, and thank you for your patience today. Again, my name is Sherry Rostern. I'm the Curator of Education at the Dakota Prairie Museum in Aberdeen, South Dakota.